Hi, uh, this is John Steyerman. Uh, I'm giving a talk to the North American Dipter Society and it's meeting with the Entomological Society of America. And the title of my talk, as you can see, is the systematic revision of the personal fly genus Xanthophyto. Uh, before I um, uh, talk about Xanthophyto, I just wanna mention that there are over 300 genera of tachinids uh, in uh, North America, and the vast majority of them need revision. Um, and and the, one of the reasons that I decided to, to embark on this project with the Xanthophyto is I thought I could chip away a little bit. It's a little piece of that. And I thought, I thought Xanthophyto would be a pretty easy place to start because there are only two described species um, in uh, North America, uh, and then another two described species in the Neotropical region. Uh, in addition, I thought it might be a good place to start uh, because uh, Jim um, O'Hara had, had noticed that there were clearly some new species or undescribed species uh, in the Southwest. Um, and uh, this genus has potential economic importance as uh, because they're parasitoids of caterpillars that are stem borers or cone borers um, often in, in uh, conifers and conifer plantations. Uh, Xanthophyto are relatively large uh, flies, bigger than a house fly. Uh, kind of drably marked, uh, black and gray, and with a tessellated um, abdomen, often with uh, a reddish um, trigite five, which uh, is strongly uh, strongly resembles uh, sarcophagids. Um, and I don't think this is just chance. They are clearly mimicking uh, sar sarcophagids. And uh, I don't know why that might be. I don't know, but we can maybe talk about it with our fear sometime. Uh, Xanthophyto belong to the subfamily Tachinini, which is the subfamily with the big buzzies and then the hedgehog flies. They belong to a different tribe, the small uh, tribe Nemorini, uh, which is really well defined uh, morphologically as well as uh, genetically. Uh, and it consists of a, a few uh, neotropical genera, generally small. Uh, Xanthophyto, and then the widespread genus Nemorea, which is found across like the old world, um, Europe, Asia, Africa, etc. Now, I'm not going to uh, bore you with sort of detailed species descriptions of, of each of the species that I've been recognizing, but I want to talk about the, the integrative approach that I've been trying to use to, to recognize and define um, species and, and their relationships. So I've been using, of course, external morphological characters um, and um, dissecting genitalia, especially for males, but also uh, I've been using uh, barcode sequences that Jim O'Hara has uh, helped generate um, stages from um, the puparium, uh, clues from geographic distributions, as well as um, information about host associations. Uh, and I think sort of using all these different lines of evidence uh, it's going to allow me, or it's going to help me to sort of pull apart some of these species uh, or, or species groups that would otherwise be difficult if I just relied on one of these, um, these lines of evidence. Uh, so uh, just to give you some examples of, of the different lines of evidence I'm using, uh, here uh, are some pictures of various amphiphytous species in North America. And they're pretty uh, homogenous, although you can see some variation in, in coloration and some have a lot of reddish on the end of the abdomen, some have little. Uh, here are some close ups of the heads, and you can see that again, they're pretty similar looking, although there is some variation, um, for example, in, in the shape and coloration of the, uh, the antennae post, post pedestal. And just an example, as an example of, of how some of these morphological characters uh, vary between closely related species. Um, here's species 8A antennae, they don't have names yet. Uh, and you can see that there are, there are pretty distinct differences in this, both the shape uh, and the coloration of the post pedestal. Uh, in addition, uh, species 8A has kind of swollen palpi, whereas species 10E has more linear palpi. Uh, and there's some other sort of features of the head and, and some contactic features um, that help separate or, or define these species. Uh, I've also looked at genitalia, and as you can see, the genitalia are relatively homogenous in this group, unlike a lot of um, groups of flies uh, in, in which the male genitalia can be diagnostic and tell you what species it is. It doesn't seem to be the case in Xanthophyto. 
Um, they're pretty similar. There's a lot of variation within species. That's as much variation, variation between species. But in some cases, there are some, some traits and some clues that, that can be used to separate um, otherwise similar looking, similar looking species. For example, Xanthophyto versicolor and species 10e are, are very closely related and they, or they look very similar uh, morphologically. Actually, they're not that closely related, but they look very similar morphologically externally. Uh, but there are some clear differences in, in the genitalia. Uh, the um, the Syncircus uh, has these larger dorsal lobes um, in 10e. Uh, the, the shape, the beak of the Syncircus is a little bit different. Um, the, the, Cirrostylar arms are, are thicker uh, and hairier um, in versicolor. The pandurium is more humped. So there are some characters from the genitalia that help separate species, but, but generally um, I can't just dissect something and know what it is. Um, it's not that simple. Uh, of course, uh, genetic data has been extremely useful for separating a lot of the taxa here and helping to resolve um, certain groups. For example, um, species 10 and 10b are very similar morphologically. There's not a lot of clear, consistent differences between them, uh, but they're clearly uh, quite distinct genetically with more than 5% sequence divergence. So this is, the sequence data has really helped me to figure out some of these problems. I want to, however, um, say a word of caution with using you know, barcode sequences blindly. Uh, some of the sequence I have, sequences I have from the same species that are clearly the same species based on all other lines of evidence are widely divergent, um, falling in different places in the tree. And I think this is largely an artifact of poor uh, sequence data um, or degraded sequence data. So a lot of, a lot of this, this data is from museum specimens that were collected 50 or 100 years ago, or maybe not 100, but 50 years ago. Um, but still, you, so you, you can't just take these um, take these uh, barcodes uh, at face value, you, you need to look at them in the context of other traits, of, of other morphological traits. Um, on the converse, on the other side of things, uh, there is one particular radiation within xanthophyto of these North American species where there's a lot of very similar um, species that have uh, diverged uh, quite recently. Uh, and in some cases, these appear to share or at least have very little um, divergence in barcodes, like far less than 1%. Um, but other lines of evidence strongly indicate that they're distinct species. And so I have both species with widely uh, divergent sequences and then species that share, essentially share barcodes with other species uh, in this group. Again, super valuable tool, but, but you need to, to consider other lines of evidence. Uh, for example, uh, many, because they're often parasitoids of um, forest pests, a lot of xanthophyto species have been reared, um, and oftentimes the, the people that reared them saved those puparia um, with the specimens, which is great because there's some nice characters of the puparium, particularly these posterior spiracles. Uh, so species 8b and 8e are pretty much um, identical genetically. Uh, there's, you can't really separate them out um, uh, with barcodes, and yet they're clearly distinct uh, in terms of these um, sp spiracles on, on the puparium. Um, and AD is another species in that group that also has um, uh, distinct uh, posterior spiracles that are tricuspid. I've also been looking at the distributions of species to, to help me, you know, as confirmatory evidence or corroboratory evidence uh, about species divisions. You can see there either there's eastern or there's western species and there's eastern species. There aren't eastern and western species um, and there's no midwestern species uh, it appears. And I don't know this could be due to lack of collecting but I suspect it actually just reflects the lack of trees uh, in the mid midwest um, part of the continent. Uh, and uh, oftentimes we have related species um, on, on different sides um, of this um, of this sort of treeless um, Midwest. So we have species five west and species five east. These are sister species as far as I can tell. They're quite similar morphologically, although they do have some distinctive features. 
um, but they have widely disjunct distributions associated with um, mountain or mountainous habitats, or cooler habitats um, in the east um, and in the west. As I mentioned, um, you can also get some clues to as to some of the species uh, boundaries um, used by the their ecology and their host associations. So species 8A attacks a pyralid, um, um, dir dir sorry, Dirichtria amatella, the southern pine cone worm that bores into pine cones and therefore it can be important pest in pine plantations. Um, and it actually it gets to these larvae with, or gets to these hosts with, with host searching larvae that can crawl into these, um, these holes and, and, and get them. Uh, species 8B, related species, attacks an unrelated uh, moth that's also a borer in, in conifers, uh, the pitch mass borer, which is a seceded. Uh, and then right down here, we have this species 7 that attacks um, pyralids that are in completely, a completely different habitat. It attacks web making pyralids in broad on broadleaf trees. So this like this maple uh, webworm. So again, these host associations can provide some additional clues um, about uh, species identity uh, and limits. So um, how many species of Xanthophyton are there? Uh, I'm not sure yet, I'm not done with this. This is all a work in progress, but so far I've been able to sort of separate um, about 18 species uh, in North America. And I've been examining specimens from um, Central and South America. Uh, and there's at least uh, 20 more um, species that I've been able to recognize from museum material uh, that are neotropical. So this is like an order of magnitude um, more species than were known before um, I started looking at this, uh, which is kind of amazing for such a, you know, a relatively large um, genus in, in terms of size, large body genus. In North America, this really well-studied area, you know, there's you know, the vast majority of species um, still, are still undescribed. Um, and I kind of wonder, you know, when I'm especially when I'm looking at some of these South American ones, whether some of these species may be extinct. Um, yeah, and I'm basically looking at fossils. They may not still exist in the wild. Anyway, um, thanks uh, for your time. And I'd like to acknowledge um, Juan, Manu Juan Manuel, my PhD student, master student Jeff Brown, and then uh, various museum workers and colleagues that have been helped out. Um, thank you very much.